Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble. He founded the website dollarcollapse.com. You can follow him on Substack at rubino.substack.com. Welcome back to the show. Hey, Jim. How similar is today's stock market to that of the late 1990s uh, dot-com bubble, where it collapsed in 2000? Eerily similar. Uh, in, in both cases, there was a decade-long bull market that culminated in a, um, a blow-off top. There was a, a new technology that was going to change the world and that everybody had to have. It was the Internet back then and artificial intelligence now. Uh, the market um, ended up being supported by just a handful of high-powered tech stocks that, uh, that were never going to go down in the 1990s. Same thing now. We've got something called the Magnificent Seven, which is the seven stocks led by NVIDIA, um, the big chip maker, that uh, everybody assumes it will just keep going up forever. Uh, and now we're, um, you know, we're finding out if it ends the same way it lived. And uh, in, in, in the dot combo in the 1990s, everything fell apart in 2000. And a lot of those big stocks dropped by 90%. Um, and we'll see. Yeah. Will big tech stocks like NVIDIA crash the way they did in 2000? Um, yeah, they they very probably will. And here, here's a good example. You um, put things in perspective. There was a company called Cisco Systems back in the 1990s that um, was sort of the NVIDIA of its day. It made the... Um, the technology that made the internet possible. So everybody assumed that an unlimited amount of that tech was going to be needed and they bought it whenever it was available. And Cisco, I think, did vendor financing too, where they let money to people to, in order to buy their stuff. So they, they rack up massive sales. But when the, uh, when the oversupply finally hit, when it turned out that there wasn't unlimited demand for internet related gear, um, it turned out that uh, a lot of people had such gear that they couldn't do anything with, so they put it back on the market as used, and um, there was a deluge of uh, NVIDIA's machines um, being offered for like 10% of the uh, original price, and that caused NVIDIA to, you know, NVIDIA itself did not, I'm sorry, uh, Cisco, Cisco Systems didn't collapse um, as a business. It made roughly the same amount of revenues year after year for a while right there, but its stock dropped by 90% because all of a sudden it wasn't making the kind of money that it made. And, and I think very possibly, possibly the same thing is going to happen with AI because um, everybody's buying AI chips, not just from NVIDIA, but from all the other chip makers who are uh, producing those kinds of chips. Uh, on the assumption that they need to buy them whenever they're available because maybe they won't be available in the future because demand is infinite. Uh, and I suspect that at some point in the next couple of years, people find out that, that there aren't really any killer apps yet for artificial intelligence. Like it's not going to, it will change the world, but it's not going to make lots of money for lots of people right away. And then a lot of those chips come back on the market and NVIDIA's sales drop uh, and their price will plunge in that circumstance along with a bunch of other tech stocks so I, I think we have the same trajectory down as we did up in the comparison with the 1990s so the next few years are, are possibly going to be one of the most brutal bear markets for at least big tech stocks ever 
The Fed's talking about an interest rate cut in September. Is this likely, and what kind of impact will lower rates have on the economy? Well, they're talking about it, uh, but but at the same time, um, a lot of headline level financial statistics still point to a growing economy. They just had good retail sales come out either yesterday or the day before, for instance, and that's that's a sign, you know, if if um, if you can believe those numbers, that's a sign that the economy is still growing. But you can't really believe those numbers because the government lies about their headline numbers and then they quietly revise those numbers back to what they really were to begin with um, over time, but nobody pays attention. So you've got to think that the Fed knows that and understands that the economy is much weaker than the headline numbers make it seem like uh, and that that's their rationale for cutting interest rates. And also it's a, an election year. So the incumbent party um, would like interest rates to be moving down before the election. And uh, obviously, behind the scenes, they're putting pressure on the Fed to do that. So, so yeah, I think there's a de- decent chance that interest rates start falling in September. And then I, I think it's uh, look out below after that because the economy is getting weaker. A recession is coming. That tech stock bubble bursting that, you know, that we talked about before is, is in prospect. So I think when you and I talk this time next year, it's going to be a completely different world and interest rates will be much lower. The economy will be much weaker and people will be a lot more worried than they are now. Do you think uh, the promise of uh, of President Trump being reelected uh, has people overly optimistic on the markets? Well, yeah. See, we we have this sense, and maybe everybody everywhere does, that uh, when you bring in new people, they can quote unquote fix things and bring everything back to normal. But uh, no matter who is in charge of the U.S. economy, we're still going to be. Um, running deficits of $2 trillion plus per year. Uh, the interest cost on that debt is going to be going up, even if interest rates go down, because the debt itself is growing at such a um, dramatic rate. Um, consumers are still out of money, and they're putting a lot of their lives on plastic now and having to pay credit card level, you know, 22 25% interest rates. So all of that stuff is uh, is out there waiting to uh, to bite us. And there's not really much of a chance for a new government to come in and just wave a magic wand to fix all that stuff because they they can't balance the budget. (laughs) They they can only manipulate interest rates to a a fairly minor uh, extent if the economy isn't cooperating. So uh, we we basically have to deal with the problems we've created and who's ever in charge is going to be responsible for how we deal and responsible for the um, the problems that that creates. So I, I, you know, I I love the idea of new, fresh ideas, but I I don't think there are any that are capable of actually fixing the the problems that we have right now. Gold briefly touched on a new all time high this week. How much farther can it run from here? Well, two answers to that. One is that um, gold is rising now in response to, first of all, the general anxiety out there in the world. And the second, second of all, the prospect of central banks starting to cut interest rates and going back to easier money, which is good for precious metals. Um, that means, based on the stuff that's going on right this minute, where interest rates might go and stuff like that, uh, gold could still have a nice run from here. You know, we could see $3,000 gold in, in U.S. dollars in the not too distant future. And that might take silver up to 40 or $50 an ounce. But longer term, uh, given the fact that the big countries of the world, with the exception of Russia, have absolutely no choice but to inflate away their currencies, um, gold and silver, it's hard to know what the top is, put it that way. I, I think I would consider selling some gold at $5,000 an ounce and maybe a little more at $10,000 an ounce, but I don't know if that's the top. <laughs> um, we're, we're messing up on such a vast scale that, um, you know, we, we have no choice but to try to inflate our, our currencies away in order to deal with all this debt, which takes us to some kind of a monetary reset at some point um, in which uh, we might go back to something like a gold standard, but with gold at a much higher price. So I, I think the new normal for gold is liable to be in the uh, five to $10,000 range and the, 
panic buying level, it's anybody's guess. Panic level buying. That's interesting. Um, mm-hmm. Has there been much of an impact on the gold market now that we have what I call retail gold at Walmart and uh, Costco? Yeah, that uh, that adds an impulse buy element to all this because they're, they're making it easy to buy gold. It used to be a little tricky. Like you had to go down to a coin shop and and uh, know what you were buying or you had to uh, go online and, and uh, maybe – do a wire transfer or something like that and uh, then then wait for your gold to come and that was a little tricky too but uh, costco and walmart you know you know how to shop online for stuff with them and and it is just like that i bought some silver rounds a while ago at walmart.com it was exactly the same as buying anything else you put it in your cart you click check out it takes your credit card and debits it and in a couple of days your metal shows up so it makes it very easy for people to get it. And then around the world, there are um, there are other variations of this. In South Korea, they sell gold in um, in vending machines. <laughs> you go to a convenience store and you can buy little gold bars out of vending machines. And apparently, those vending machines are selling out just a couple hours after they're filled up. And I don't know how they do it in Vietnam, but I know the Central Bank of Vietnam had to sell some of its gold in order to keep um, consumer prices of gold from running to really unreal, unrealistic, maybe dangerous levels. So consumers around the world, regular people, are starting to pick up on the whole, okay, we're screwing up our money, we need to own gold thesis. And that adds, um, that adds buying power, basically, to the market. Uh, already central banks are big net buyers of gold, which is a very big deal. Money's starting to flow back into physical gold and silver ETFs, which is a very big deal. And now you've got uh, individuals buying it physically at a retail level. So that that all points in the direction of higher prices going forward. We can't know about the timing, but uh, generally speaking, the, the mood of the market is really positive for precious metals. Is there a big difference between actually having that gold in your hand and having a piece of paper that says you own gold? A huge difference. Um, there's an old saying, if you, if you can't hold it, you don't really own it. And that's, that's true because anything else than physical gold and silver in your hand has a counterparty risk that goes along with it. Somebody has to keep a promise for your gold stored remotely or your gold mining stock or, or whatever um, to actually be worth anything. And with some of your wealth, you really want it to be in a form that doesn't have counterparty risks because we can't trust those counterparties out there anymore. The world is becoming very um, incompetent and untrustworthy now. So you want to own some precious metals that you can get to that, you know, they're either right there or they're in a place that are very, that's very accessible. Now, once you've done that, then you can branch out a little bit. There are physical ETFs that are run by legitimate companies called like Sprott that, uh, that will buy uranium or copper or gold or silver and put it in a vault for you and store it. And that's reasonably safe. And then a bank safe deposit has some risks. But it's also reasonably safe, not 100 percent safe, but uh, something that is, you know, much safer than a stock in the stock market or something like that, which if you can't get to your brokerage house um, online, then you really don't know what you've got. So you can kind of take this in stages where you buy the physical stuff, hold it in a safe place, and then you branch out a little bit at a time um, in terms of convenience and risk and then add precious metals related assets that way but uh, don't put all your eggs in any one basket how is silver doing silver is not doing as well as gold in terms of all-time highs gold just hit an all-time high silver is um, <clears throat> still twenty dollars an ounce away from its all-time high um, but just very recently it has started to outperform gold in in percentage terms and um, Silver usually 
works this way, but not not with quite the lag that it has now. But it's it usually goes with a lag with gold. Gold will go up first because that's the the, uh, the safe haven asset that everybody understands. They go there first. They buy their gold. It pushes the gold price up. Uh, and then people look around and say, whoa, silver is sort of the same thing, but it's way cheaper. And so people start buying silver, and then it really takes off. We're not there yet, but uh, I, I think there's a decent chance that over the next couple of years, uh, when gold goes up, silver goes up more. And uh, the, the final blow-off part of the cycle for silver is breathtaking. I, I think $100 an ounce would not be – um, wouldn't be all that unrealistic. So we could see something like that and then much, much higher going forward as the whole monetary collapse slash reset starts to play out. How safe are your precious metals in a safety deposit box if that particular bank goes under? Does your deposit um, box go with it? Yeah, in theory, no. And in theory, you you, um, you have to wait to get your the cash that you deposited with the bank, like your CD. Uh, in the U.S., the way it works is the the government insures financial accounts like that up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and so you get it back. Although you don't know what the value of two hundred fifty thousand dollars is going to be by the time you get that money back. Um, so in theory, um, your your bank is reasonably safe for deposits. Now, with a safe deposit box, uh, there are two issues there. One is that, um, you know, a bank can be robbed. And it, you, and you come up and say, well, I had a million dollars worth of silver in my safe deposit box. How do you prove that, right? Um, so it's not clear how you get back what you've lost if, uh, if thieves break into a bank overnight and clean out all the safe deposit boxes. So that, that's an issue. And the other issue is the whole bank bail-in thing. Now, it's very politically risky to just, you know, have a bank get in trouble and then take money away from the depositors in order to bail out the bank. But in the world that's coming, you never know just how crazy the government is going to behave. And there, there was a um, a private safe deposit box company a while ago where um, supposedly some of the holders of safe deposit boxes were using them to launder, launder money. The FBI took over the thing and took all the safe deposit box contents. They didn't give anything back to anybody. So it, there's a risk. I mean, none of that is a, um, you know, a 50-50 risk or anything like that. It's more like a one or 2% risk, but it's still there. Uh, but the, um, the thing is, everything carries a risk. Like if you store, store gold in your house, your house can be robbed. You know, you personally can be robbed. Stuff like that is possible, too. So nothing is absolutely risk-free. And what you're dealing with is different types of risk. You've kind of got to juggle and, and kind of got, got to reconcile. And you combine them into a portfolio of assets that has the best possible risk profile um, relative to the best possible profit and safety, you know, financial safety in terms of the assets going up profile. So, you know, nothing is perfect. You need to learn about the risks no matter what you're looking at. But um, you always want to diversify as best you can, no matter what kind of an asset class you're talking about. How safe are the uh, smaller and mid-sized banks in the U.S. Uh, considering how many uh, big office blocks are empty or, or almost empty? Yeah, we do have a banking crisis coming, and here's how it will very possibly play out. Now, like you said, big office buildings are sitting too close to empty for their owners to be able to make any money on them, so they're being sold at big discounts to, for instance, the the money that they borrowed to buy it. Well, that creates unrealized losses, which become realized losses once the buildings are sold. Uh, and a lot of that bad paper, a lot of those losses are on the balance sheets of U.S. banks. So when, um, when those losses start being reported, uh, there's a risk that depositors of those banks will start pulling their money out, which forces the banks to sell even more depreciated assets and take even bigger losses and so on until they collapse. And um, then the government's going to have to step in and bail them out. So that is something that is very, um, you never want to say probable about 
a, a financial crisis that hasn't happened yet. But I, I, that's, this is close enough for me to say that's probably how it's going to go. You know, there's probably going to be a crisis in the uh, office building part of commercial real estate, which is going to cause a crisis in the local and regional bank sector. So I think that happens. And um, because of that, you 100% do not want to have deposits with those banks that exceed the FDIC insurance limit, first and foremost. And you, uh, you know, you don't really even want to hold any more money than you have to for transactions in a bank like that. So just be careful. You know, it, there, there is risk wherever you look. The banking sector is, uh, is maybe ground zero for the next crisis. So um, don't keep everything in a bank. Have, you know, brokerage houses are slightly less ri at risk for this, this thing is coming. So have some money maybe in a brokerage house, have some money overseas if you can do it. You know, if, you, if you're able, if you're sophisticated enough and you have enough capital to have some foreign bank accounts, then you want to start looking at where's the safest country for something like that. Singapore is good. Switzerland is good. Um, there's a few others and uh, you, you might want to consider something like that, but it's, it's, it's all about diversification because nothing is risk free. Everything carries a risk. Lots of things have big potential rewards and you just need to be able to combine those things. You know, in, in my Substack newsletter, that's basically the, the point of it is we're trying to figure out, um, ways to position ourselves for what's coming in a, in order to minimize the risks to the extent that's, that that's possible and maximize what you make when these big crises create big opportunities. And it's all possible. And it's just an intellectual challenge. You know, we have to figure out how to do it. If there's a major recession with uh, following layoffs, could those laid off workers never return to work because AI has taken their position? <laughs> Well, AI is going to automate a lot of things. Like, for for instance, if I was, um, my, my kids are too old to listen to me anymore, but if they were 17 again, you know, I would tell them, um, learn to work with your hands. You know, you, you want to be able to deal with the physical world in some way that you get paid for, because that's the last thing to be automated um, if it's a complex thing, like being an electrician or repairing cars or being a plumber or something like that it is vastly more secure than being a paralegal or a mid-level or low-level computer programmer. Those things are being automated away at an accelerating rate. So what used to be a rock-solid set of credentials is now becoming more and more useless. So, you know, do, do not go get a psych degree for... Um, a hundred thousand um, dollars. Don't think because you're, uh, you know, it, it, you're, you're a, a web designer that you're going to be able to work in web design for the rest of your life because that's not how it's going to play out. Um, AI is going to make a lot of things um, obsolete, and it's it's going to do it in a way that is not one hundred percent predictable because we can't know how this is coming exactly, but it's coming. So. Yeah, it's it's a scary prospect for a lot of people. When you combine, you know, um, a disorderly process of automation with ludicrously high college tuition, there's going to be a lot of people out there that are going to be borderline bankrupted by the automation part of this because they're going to have, you know, $100,000 of student loan or a quarter million of student loans or whatever, and their job is going to be, uh, it's just going to disappear. And so what do you do then? You know, you can't, discharge your student loans in bankruptcy. I so you got to pay them off, but your job that you spend all that money learning how to do is gone. So that's, that's something that's out there waiting to happen too. So uh, I, th there are lots of ways that politically that we could possibly respond to it, but we don't know exactly what we're going to do right now. I know Europe is uh, looking at a robot tax. If a person is replaced by AI or a robot, they have to, uh, the company has to contribute to support that person or laid off well, people in yeah, general. That's, that, that's very possibly the way it goes because um, there's going to be huge amounts of profit flowing to the people who own the technology that automates a lot of different industries. And um, 
at the same time, that's going to make a lot of people unemployed and broke and maybe bankrupt and maybe destitute for life. And so we have to figure out how to, um, how to divide those income streams up in a way that avoids, well, first of all, avoids, avoids just huge amounts of human suffering. And second of all, avoids, avoids some kind of French revolutionary scenario where the, um, the aristocracy gets beheaded. And because you, if you bankrupt, um, 99% of the population, then, uh, they're going to be angry and there's going to be a lot of them. So the, the, the people who own the robots have got to think this through as it goes along because, uh, there, there's no point in being rich if you're dead. And that's, that's a very real prospect out there for some of them. We'll have more with John Rubino right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino. John, politics in the U.S. and Europe are increasingly unsettled. How does this affect the financial markets? Oh boy, politics is really unsettled now. And, you, know, you know, just when you thought it couldn't get any crazier, um, in in Europe, the Labour Party wins a super majority in Britain, which means um, wide open borders and uh, higher marginal tax rates, probably. And in France, the uh, the far left, and and in Europe, you know, the, the conservatives are not really conservative by American standards, but the the um, the left is very very left. You know, they're legit socialists and quasi communists and uh in france it looks like the um the far left is now the most powerful political party and if they get to rule they're talking about a 90 percent uh marginal tax rate on incomes over four hundred thousand dollars a year you know that's that's gonna cause a complete meltdown of the whole financial system in france if that happens uh but anyhow that's that's what's happening in europe oh oh and in germany the um what they call the far right which as i said is not really very far right but uh, that that party is um rising in the polls so the german government just made it illegal for anybody who's part of that party to own a gun you know um that's inconceivable in the to Euro- u.s ears but to authoritarian europe that apparently is not inconceivable at all it's now the law um, now here in the u.s we, we had um, a dementia patient being run for president by, by one party and uh, donald trump being run by the other party and you know it kind of sort of looked like it was going to be a a republican victory although you you never know how it goes it wasn't a blowout or, or anything but it looked like a, the republicans were going to win and then trump almost gets assassinated and he he gets back up with all his um, so, uh, secure, secret service people around him, and then uh, you know he holds his fist in the air and and, uh, and blood's coming down his face. And these visuals are so amazing that uh, Trump's popularity just went way up. So now maybe the the uh, Democrat establishment is going to remove Biden, put somebody else in with him in, in place of him that might have a chance to win, and Trump is at the moment way up and it looks like a republican sweep and you know this is all crazy stuff um and uh, we still got a, a couple of months to go so we have no idea how this is gonna um shake out in the end but um very it's very possible that whoever loses feels like they were robbed again because in 2016 the democrats thought they were robbed in 2020 the republicans were sure they were robbed and this time around completely possible again that somebody thinks they're robbed and, and that's uh, you know it led to a little bit of civil unrest here in the u.s but it could lead to a lot more so ah, yeah and and the the moral of all this is that when you screw up your financial system you end up screwing up your political system and we have screwed up our financial system in the u.s europe big chunks of Asia, um, on an absolutely biblical scale. We've got a, a gigantic financial crisis coming that's going to be, a, you know, hyperinflation and or a 1930-style depression followed by some kind of huge monetary reset that helps one group of people and hurts another group of people. That, that's all baked into the cake. And you're seeing politics reflect that uncertainty. 
So under no circumstances should we expect whichever party wins smooth sailing after that. It's still going to be chaotic because uh, an election does not fix a broken financial system. So that's just where we are and expect more of the same. Do people put too many high hopes on uh, a change of regime and government to change their lives? It's natural for people to think that because um, change is change is comforting and it's exciting. And when you get new people in, you know, you have their promises for what they're going to do, but none of the results yet. So it's easy just to focus on the promise. Oh, you know, he, he wants to bring back all the jobs from China or he wants to cut our taxes or, you know, he wants to close the border. All good things, but uh, not not necessarily politically doable. And, um, and in this case, it really doesn't matter because no, no matter what any politician is promising right now, the system is so broken that until we fix the broken system, really doesn't matter what politicians say. Now, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to talk about one exception to this now because it is possible for a change of government to result in a change of foreign policy that maybe brings us back from the brink of World War Three, where we are right now. And let's say it's Trump because he's the one who's promising that. So if he comes into office and cuts a deal with Russia, cuts a deal with China, cuts a deal with Iran um, and Hamas and Israel, and, and there are no more big wars after a year of that, then as far as I'm concerned, um, Donald Trump is Winston Churchill. You know, he prevented my kids from being incinerated in a nuclear holocaust, and he is a great man. Um, that that won't stop the financial system from spinning out of control, but it's still a fundamentally, manifestly great thing and a big improvement in the world. You know, if we just have to deal with the financial crisis, we can manage that. We get, we've gotten through financial crises many times in human history. Um, it's a um, multi-country nuclear war that would be hard to get past. And if we can avoid that, the rest of this stuff is basically just an investment thesis, you know. It's going to be weird times. Uh, if we get it right, we make a fortune, and then we help our friends and family. You know, that that could easily be how this plays out, but not if we kill each other in a nuclear war. So um, that's one reason to look at politics as something meaningful, because if um, if peace flows from it, then it was worthwhile. Every politician, it seems, promises the world or the moon or something uh, during their uh, campaign. Then once they're elected, they say, well, I did say I was going to bring in this program, but the other guys did such a bad job of running the government we can't afford to. Should there be legislation that says if you promise something, you have to carry through or resign? <laughs> um, they'd get around it. You remember the government is made up of lawyers. Mm. So the, the people that write a law like that are the same people that intend to evade a law like that. So they build in all kinds of loopholes. Um, now, uh, politicians make promises and then they go back on their promises. That's just how the system works. Um, I think you get credit for honestly trying. Like if you, if you sincerely um, put forth legislation and then fight for that legislation, but it loses by a few votes because the other side wouldn't go along with it. You still get credit, even though you failed. And I think that's the best we can hope for anybody we elect. If they sincerely try to, to do the things they promised us they were going to do, and maybe they get one or two things. And if that's our expectation, then that's it's realistic enough to see these people in a light that allows us to respect them, even if they don't do everything they promised. We touched on this, but is the commercial real estate market still the most likely catalyst for a bank crisis and recession? Yeah, pay attention to commercial real estate because it's uh, the office building part is really serious. Um, but multifamily housing, in other words, apartment buildings, are also starting to uh, see higher delinquency rates on the related debt. And then over on the um, the housing side, you know, the single family housing side, um, that, the house market in the U.S. is just frozen. Even though um, interest rates are down a little bit, so people have been refiing their mortgages more than in the past, 
but people still can't buy houses at today's prices because you, you combine today's interest rates or anything like today's interest rates with today's prices and the out of reach of the down and, and, you know, it doesn't look like there's any um, help for that because consumers, who are the people who buy houses, are racking up so much more credit card debt now that um, they're, they're actually moving backwards. They're becoming less and less able to qualify for a mortgage. So I, I think we need the housing bust that normally comes at this point in the cycle to happen sooner rather than later and shave, um, you know, 50 per percent off the price of the average house to get that market going again until that point um you know it's not a good time to buy a house <laughs> and it won't be for quite a while john thank you so much for chatting with us thanks jim my guest has been john rubino author of several books on the economy including the money bubble find him on substack at rubino.substack.com if you have any questions for John or for any of our guests, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on X at HowStreet. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.